All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And welcome to day two of the Avalanche Hacks Summer 2022. And today it's going to be day one of our workshop sessions that we have actually lined up for the hackathon piece itself. Um, joining us today um, will be two speakers, one from Quick Note and the other one will actually be from the Graph Foundation, who will be bringing you through two different topics um, with regards to um, uh, uh, an area, a content area that will be helpful for you when it comes to building for the hackathon piece, especially if you're working on the yeah, bounty uh, for the hackathon itself. But before we begin today, uh, I'll first like to say a big thanks to our sponsors for Ava Avalanche Hacks Summer 2022, um, the Graph Foundation, Quick Note, uh, and Certic as well, who have actually um, contributed to the bounties for the hackathon piece and essentially also contributed uh, to the mentors who will actually be helping you along with um, the hackathon piece as well. So today, um, I will just like to quickly run an overview of the hackathon piece just so that everyone here today um, are well acquainted with what the hackathon is and just kind of briefly set an understanding and tone for the Avalanche Hacks Summer 2022 as well. So Avalanche Hacks Summer 2022, essentially it's a hackathon that's going to be focusing on two disruptive technology, which is GameFi and DeFi itself, um, as, it, as it continues to gain momentum in the Web3 scene and um, this hackathon in itself is really about anchoring uh, every individual to solve challenges in these two main areas using Avalanche, um, the blazing fast, low cost and eco-friendly platform. So first track um, that any of the participants who are registering for the hackathon uh, would be DeFi track. Uh, and essentially this track itself really wants you to focus on utilizing Avalanche's um, a network uh, to create DeFi, debts, tooling, and infrastructure to attract and onboard um, new waves of users uh, on DeFi itself. GameFi, on the other hand, uh, really explores you leveraging the power of Avalanche to explore new mechanics um, for Web3 gaming to create a fun and interactive experiences for gaming um, and gamers, essentially and really for you to kind of look at different pieces of game that you can actually create as part of your project submissions as well. So different elements that you can explore will be game economics, streaming, community man management, uh, education, um, and, and very various components that you can look at. For sponsors bounties, uh, and that's also something that you can take on and latch on the main track that you've actually selected, will be from Quick Note, um, the graph and also Certic who have actually contributed to the various bounty which you can work on with very very prices that you can look at. Just a call out that there's a price pool of 55,000 um, that you can work on to kind of secure for yourself and uh, it's quite a large number of um, amount that you can kind of look at. Quick note to everyone, uh, first of all, apart from the fact that uh, any teams uh, that has been formed to participate at the hackathon, be it as a solo hacker or forming a teams of up to four, uh, please just a gentle reminder that all individuals need to be registered for the hackathon in order for the team to qualify for the prizes, um, especially if you have actually um, come out as one of the winners either for the bounties of the track itself um, we will drop the registration link. If you have not already done so, you can utilize this opportunity to kind of click on as well. Most importantly, um, it's all project submissions are definitely welcome regardless of the complexity of your idea. Avalanche over here really looks at how we can encourage every individual to kind of work on uh, different project submissions for the hackathon and you don't do utilize this opportunity to kind of submit the ideas that you have um, for the hackathon piece. So just a quick shout out that um, throughout the two workshops that's going to be taking place in a bit, if you have any questions that you would like to ask any of the speakers, please drop them in the Q&A box um, that you can see on Zoom. For those who are joining us live on Angel Hack YouTube channel, uh, you may drop the questions over there as well and we will get to them uh, toward the, towards the end of each of the workshop sessions as well. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Sahil from... Uh, quick note, 
who will cover on how to create a DEP on Avalanche. Sahil. Hey. So thanks, Justin, for the introduction. And uh, hi, everyone, at the uh, Avalanche Hacks Summer 2022 edition. And uh, first, let me introduce about myself. So I am Sahil Sain from QuickNote. I work as a developer evangelist at quicknote.com, which is a RPC provider for multiple blockchains. And uh, we recently launched our support for Avalanche for its mainnet and Fuji testnet. So like, let's just get into it without like wasting a lot of time. So let's just see how we can configure our uh, frameworks, smart contract frameworks, as well as MetaMask to work with QuickNotes, Fuji, Avalanche testnet. So quickly, let me share my screen. All right. So I already gave you a brief introduction about QuickNote. So this is how the website looks. And this is our Avalanche chain page. And you can see, as I already mentioned, that we support mainnet and Fuji testnet. And uh, uh, you can just create an account on QuickNode. And then you'll have to verify your email address. And then after that, you'll see a dashboard similar to this. So you just have to click on create an endpoint, then select Avalanche, Fuji testnet, and then select continue. As at the moment, we don't have any add-ons for Avalanche. You just have to select create endpoint. So basically add-ons are different, different add-ons like archive add-on, trace add-on, NFT add-on, token add-on. They give you extra functionality over your RPC node, not just getting the RPC data, but give, they give you extra high level API access to the, to the chain. So this is our Avalanche QG testnet endpoint, which we created within, like not within, not even within a second, like faster than that. So we have a HTTP endpoint as well as a WSS WebSocket endpoint. So what we will do is now we will configure our MetaMask to point to this endpoint so that we can use our Avalanche chain in MetaMask. So I'll just quickly open MetaMask. This is a demo account. So I don't have to worry about sharing anything like private keys or anything. And you guys also make sure that while developing, please do not use your main MetaMask account. Please create a separate MetaMask account with separate set of private keys. So I'll just name it UG Testnet and paste the URL over here. So what we will be doing is we will be using the C chain of Avalanche, which is a sub network of Avalanche. We will be using a C chain and like to deploy the EVM based smart contract. So Avalanche supports EVM based methods, EVM based contracts via its C chain. So what we will do is we'll have to add some extra variables to our endpoint. So we'll have to add ext slash pc slash c slash rpc. And what this will enable us is to use our Avalanche endpoint to deploy EVM based smart contracts. So as you can see, the uh, MetaMask browser has already fetched the chain ID and it's suggesting us to put chain ID 43113. So that's what we are gonna do. I'm sorry, yeah, 43113. And the currency symbol is AVAX, obviously. So we will put AVAX and even that's what, and even that MetaMask suggests. So currency symbol is AVAX because it, what's happening is, since we have put our RPC URL in this new RPC URL field, the MetaMask application, browser, uh, browser's web wallet application, it's fetching the chain ID and currency symbol from that RPC URL. So that's why we are seeing those suggestions. So what we'll do is we'll save it. And then 
but to be able to work with this wallet, we'll have to get some test AVAX tokens. But uh, since I already have it, I won't be able to get it because uh, you can only use a faucet for a limited period of time and limited number of times. So what you can do is, so after you set up your test net, huge test net in your MetaMask, you can simply copy your MetaMask wallet address, which is again, uh, which should be again, a demo wallet address. You should not use your main wallet address. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry, please. I won't. Sorry, Sahil. Uh, could you zoom in a little bit just so that uh, it's easier for everyone to be able to see? Yes. 100%. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I hope this is better. Yeah, it's better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So just copy your address from here. And then this is the Avalanche faucet. You'll have to select Fuji CJ from this drop down. Select token AVAX and paste your address, which you copied from MetaMask over here. And then click on request AVAX. As I told you earlier, I already used this feature some time back, and it only allows you to request funds in a particular given period of time once. So that's why I cannot request it again. And since I already have some AVAX funds, like AVAX testnet tokens, I'll be good to deploy the token or smart contract. So yeah, now let's see that how we can deploy a smart contract on the Avalanche Fuji test network. And the smart contract will be a Solidity smart contract, which is EVM based. And as I told you earlier, we will be using the Avalanche C chain on the Fuji test net so that our EVM-based smart contract works on Avalanche network as well. So this is a boilerplate hard hat configuration. And what I have done is I have created a environment variable over here. So the environment variable has three variables. First one is Quick node URL, which is our HTTP endpoint URL for the Fuji testnet. And this is a whole URL. So we'll have to go again to our quick node dashboard. Let me zoom in on this one for better visibility. And what I'll do is I'll just copy this, go back to my environment variable or environment file, and just edit this part. All right, so this is our quick node HTTP Avalanche Fuji testnet endpoint URL. And what you'll have to do is you'll just have to add slash EXT slash BC slash C in caps slash RPC for this endpoint to work on the C chain of Avalanche. And then the second variable is private key. And this private key we just got from our MetaMask demo wallet again. And you can go here, click account details, then export private key, enter your MetaMask password, then confirm. So this is how you can get your MetaMask private key. Then paste it over here. And this is a wallet, uh, this is the contract address, which is of a deployed contract in the environment file, which obviously you can use to extract the deployed contract or work with the deployed contract in another app. For example, if you wanted to create a web application with React, so you can just import this contract address in your React application and work with it. But since we are yet to deploy our contract, we will just delete this and save the environment file. So now let's look at our smart contract. So this is a pretty simple, very generic smart contract, and it's a hello world smart contract. So what we are doing over here is we are 
mentioning the version of Solidity, which the smart contract will be using. Then we are importing the hard hat, like deploying, uh, deploying smart contract in this. Then we are just initiating our smart contract with a variable called hello world and declaring a string variable called hello message. Then we are initiating our smart contract with a constructor using the hello world variable and adding a dynamic variable called underscore hello message. Then we are asking our contract to print that variable. So whatever that variable must be consisting, that will be printed or that will be given as an output by the smart contract. Then we will keep like allo allocating a function to the smart contract. So this function is called hello public views returns. So it, this means that this function is called hello and it's a public function. So it can be accessed outside of the smart contract as well. It can be accessed or initialized in other smart contracts as well. It's just a view function. So it's not a write function. And then it returns a string. As we already mentioned earlier, the hello smart contracts variable called hello message, that's a string. So it returns a string and then it returns the variable, which is the actual variable where we are storing our string or the message called hello message. Then this is just a function to change our previous set message in our variable called hello message. So this is just a very simple message called console.log and then it will it's it will change the message which is already stored in hello message. So it's to this message this function is to override your message which you have already stored in your variable hello message. So this is our contract and it's pretty simple and basic. And then what we'll have to do is we'll have to write a deploy.js script, which goes under the scripts folder of hard hat. And uh, this script will tell the hard hat framework that what we want to do with our smart contract. So first we are writing an async function to deploy our smart contract. And then the, in, the, in this line, line number four, we are initiating or calling our smart contract, which we wrote here, hello world.sol. So it's just calling our smart contract, which is hello world. So for example, if you named your smart contract, um, avax.sol. So instead of hello world, hello world over here, you'll have to write avax because we are initiating our smart contract or we are calling our smart contract in deploy.js file. And on the line number fifth, what we are doing is we are changing the value of hello message variable, which was this variable to hello from quick note. So let's just change it to hello from avalanche hacks. So what this is doing, what this will do is this will add this string to this variable. So whenever we call hello message variable, this string will be printed. So basically this function which says hello and which returns this hello message variable, it will return the string hello from avalanche hacks. And uh, then on line fifth, we are deploying this contract hello world factory, which is our hello world.sol contract with this message in the variable hello message. And on line six, we are we, give, we are writing a await function. So once it's deployed, it will print contract deployed to hello message dot address. So it will print the address of the smart contract where it is deployed. And then on the line number nine, we are writing uh, another console log statement to deploy the address from which the smart contract was deployed. And on line 10, we are just exiting the process so that once the contract is deployed, it will print these two lines and it will stop the process.
and from line 13 to 19, we are catching if there occurs any error. So we'll just save this. And then we have a hard hat config.js. So this file says that which contract we have to use, which solidity version we have to use, which network we have to use, which account we have to deploy the smart contract with, and which network we have to use for that particular endpoint. For, so over here, we are mentioning the solidity version 0.8.6. So we will be using 0.8.6 as we already used this one in our smart contract. And then in networks, we are mentioning Fuji and the URL of the network, the endpoint URL will be processed from our environment file and from the quick node URL variable from our environment file. And the account which will be used to deploy the smart contract will be fetched from the private key, which we saved in our environment file, which is on this line two. So what this will do is process dot n dot private key. This will process our private key and form and retrieve the address of that wallet for which that private key is for. And on line 15, we are mentioning the chain ID of the network, which we will be using to deploy the smart contract, which is again, Fuji testnet. So the chain ID is 43113. And we'll just save this. And then we'll go to our terminal. We'll CD to the file. Um, one second. Uh, let me zoom in my terminal so that it's a bit clear for you. All right. One second, let me check if there's any question in chat. All right, so there's no question. So what happens, how smart contracts works is, so first we do this file and we have this deploy.js file to tell hard hat how we want to deploy the smart contract. And we have this hard hat config.js file to tell hard hat which networks and accounts we have we want to use to deploy our smart contract. So before deploying our smart contract, we have to convert our smart contract or compile our smart contract into EVM compatible code. So EVM compatible code is basically byte code. So EVM is Ethereum virtual machine and virtual machines cannot understand this high level solidity code. We'll have to convert this high level solidity code into byte code, which is tangible by the Ethereum virtual machine. So what we will do is we will compile this code by writing yarn hat compile. So this will create or compile our smart contract or solidity high level code into Ethereum virtual machine compatible or readable bytecode. So it said that this solidity file is compiled successfully. And now what we will do is we will deploy our smart contract. So yeah, we will write yarn. Hard hat. So we'll basically run deploy.js because it tells hard hat how to deploy our smart contract, right? We already wrote that deploy.js file earlier. So yarn hard hat run. No, I Network. So in this command, we are telling hard hat to deploy or I mean to run our deploy.js file with network Fuji, which is again test network for Avalanche. So as we can see, we have two. Um, we have two messages. 
contract deployed to and this is the address of the contract on which the contract is deployed on the AVAX Fuji testnet, Avalanche Fuji testnet. And the second message is contract deployed by the signer address, which is basically my wallet address, which is fetched or which is associated with this private key. So, and uh, th these two lines are basically what's printed after the successful deployment of our contract. So to see if our contract was deployed or not, I mean, just to double check, it's already deployed, but to double, double check, we can go to Snowtrace, which is a block explorer for Avalanche. We have to select testnet from over here. So the second option, and then we can paste that contract address over here to check if it's deployed or not. So as you can see, it's deployed. And if you look at the transaction hash, we can see that to which block it was deployed, the time, the uh, wallet address, which is this, which should be similar to the second line. Yeah, 44V, four, 44V. Four four, four so yeah, so in this way, we have successfully deployed a smart contract on the Avalanche Fusit Testnet and not just a smart contract, but an EVM compatible smart contract. So what you can do is if you already have a application or if you already have some smart contracts or a smart contract on Ethereum chain, and you want to build your application on Avalanche chain as well. So you can simply use QuickNode on Avalanche C chain and deploy your smart contracts on the Avalanche chain and with QuickNode, you can also retrieve information from this smart contracts, which you can see in QuickNote docs, which I will be going into deep later in the session. So this is how you can use QuickNote. And now let me give you a brief, uh, like we already talked about QuickNote, what QuickNote does, but let me give you a brief about how QuickNote works and how QuickNote achieves the speed and reliability it offers to its customers. So QuickNote is like uh, the leading chain, multi-chain cloud provider for the blockchains, for different, different blockchains, Avalanche being one of them, being one of the biggest. And uh, we uh, have like biggest uh, clients in our arsenal from Chainlink to OpenSea to Dune Analytics to Phantom to Nansen. And uh, now let me give you a brief introduction about the QuickNotes architecture, how the nodes work and how our API works. So what we do is, I mean, what basically our engineers do is we host more than 25,000 nodes all around the globe. And all of these nodes are hosted on bare metal providers, cloud providers, multi and they are all multi region So they are distributed all around the globe. So we use a combination of bare metal providers and public clouds because to provide high number of uptime, greater uptime and reduce latency. And these all providers which we use are multi-region because uh, IP hops can create a lot of latency. So what we want to provide to our users is the least amount of latency they can get. So for example, if you were to uh, make query to uh, the QuickNode API from Singapore, you will be connected to our Singapore data center. And if you were to connect from South Korea, you will be connected to our Japan data center. So what happens is about these cloud providers or bare metal providers, we have a automated routing and load balancing layer, which automatically routes your request to the nearest data center. And the load balancing layer will balance your requests. For example, the data center which is nearest to you gets overwhelmed because if there is a big NFT launch going on or if there is a huge event going on on the blockchain. So a lot of time, 
servers might get overwhelmed, but that that's not the case with Clicknode because what our API load balancing API will do is it will distribute the amount of queries which is going to the single data center and it will distribute it to the data centers which are nearby to it so that every query gets resolved and there is no downtime. And about that, about the load balancing and automated, automated load balancing and routing layer, we have our developer tooling layers, which are webhooks and NC APIs like NFT API, token API, which is not at the moment available for Avalanche, but we will soon be coming for Avalanche as well. But the NFT API are just available on Ethereum and Solana at the moment, and the token API is just available on Ethereum, and we will soon be launching it on Avalanche. And above that, we have the Quick Notes HTTP and WSS URLs endpoints. And we already saw the dashboard, which had the HTTP and the WebSocket WSS URL, we use the HTTP URL to connect our MetaMask to the Avalanche Fusion network. And then we also have a lot of resources for developers. We have our own version of Avalanche Docs. So to access that, you can go to quicknote.com slash docs. And we have a lot of developer guides, which our technical writers and our developer relations team have written to educate people or to help people get their journey get started on the in the web three space. So you can just go to quicknote.com slash guides. Over there, you will find a lot of guides to, uh, to start your like Web3 journey. And these guides are all the way from beginner level to expert level guides. So you can get the entire set of uh, knowledge base from quicknote.com slash guides. And then that's it from my side. I am Sai from QuickNode, and if you have any feedback, queries, or if you just want to shout us out, tag us on QuickNode at Twitter. So it's Q-U-I-C-K-N-O-D-E on Twitter. And if you want to reach out to me on Twitter, then you can follow me or just DM me directly on Twitter. It's S-E-N-S-A-H-I-L on Twitter. And uh, we also have a bounty going on at Avalanche Hacks summer 2022 edition and if you built on quick note you will be automatically be eligible for the bounty and we also have a discord channel in the hackathon discord it's called quick note channel and if you have any queries signing up for quick note or if you have queries in general with your code or with your dap or with your project reach out to me and i'll be happy to help so thanks guys over to you justin yeah um thanks sahil for um bringing through um the some of the content about a uh, quick note um i think now it's just kind of an opportunity for for you to answer some of the questions um that have actually uh kind of uh came up during your session in itself so um, I think there are just kind of two questions so far, um, which one of it to just kind of clarify if deploy.js file is like a test file for a smart contract or would you like to care, would you care to explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. So deploy.js file is a file in hard hat configuration. So what we are doing in deploy.js file is telling the hard hat framework that what we want to do with our smart contract and how we want to deploy it. So it's basically just saying that what, how we want to deploy our smart contract and what will happen after we have successfully deployed our smart contract. So it's basically a wrap, like it's basically a file 
which is just saying that what how our smart contract will behave. Okay. Um, the other question from uh, one of the audience who actually kind of came in today, um, it's also, um, can you share um, the GitHub repo of the code base that you were working with earlier on? So, yeah, absolutely. So what I will do is I will share with you the link. So we actually have an entire full-blown guide for this. So what I'll do is I'll share the link to the guide and the guide has step-by-step -step process to how to actually achieve this. And the guide is actually more extensive. It be, goes on beyond to create a React app. So you can create a full-blown decentralized application on Avalanche testnet. So I'm just pasting it in the chat for everyone to access. Yep. That'll be really helpful. Thank you. So um, the other part um, would be um, from the ground. Uh, can Ethereum smart contracts be actually deployed to Avalanche? Yes. So Avalanche has this uh, subnet called C-Chain. So you can use this subnet and you can deploy smart contracts on this subnet so that it is compatible with Avalanche chain as well. So if you deploy any EVM-based smart contracts on Avalanche's CNET, it will definitely work with Avalanche because Avalanche is 100% Ethereum, com Ethereum com compatible, EVM compatible on its C chain. So that's why we added that EXT B slash BC slash CAPS C slash RPC ahead of our RPC URL for our RPC URL to point to Avalanche's C chain. So yes, the answer is that Ethereum smart contracts are compatible on Avalanche, on Avalanche C chain. Okay. Um, the other question that, that came in, it's uh, uh, Sahil, you were actually adding the RPC URL in Metamask earlier on. Um, and you have actually added a text after the URL that you have actually pasted um, after that. Uh, yes. You were just making a request to see whether you can go through that portion a little bit as well. Yes. So let me quickly share my screen and show that again. Um, Justin, can you let me share my screen? Yeah, sure. Just give me a moment. Okay, here you go. Yes. All right. So let me just first uh, delete the old one so that we are able to add it again. And so what you have to do is you have to go to your quick note dashboard where you have created your avalanche node. This is a test node. So it's on Fuji testnet. So you have to copy your HTTP provider, copy it, go to MetaMask, then add a name. Um, you can add any name. I'm adding Fuji testnet. And then paste your RPC URL over here. So this actually answers to the previous question as well that can EVM smart contracts be deployed on Avalanche? So as I mentioned, yes, you can do that by using Avalanche's C chain. So as we want to deploy our smart contracts on Avalanche C chain and want to want our Avalanche network to work on MetaMask as MetaMask is EVM compatible only. So what we will do is we will have our RPC URL, quick note RPC URL point to Avalanche C chain. So for that, we have to write EXT, which is extension slash PC slash C slash RPC. So basically what we are doing over here is we are pointing our quick node RPC URL, which is the normal Avalanche Fuji test network RPC URL to point to Avalanche's C network, 
because Footnote supports Avalanche Sync's network as well. So using this, you will be able to deploy your smart contracts on C chain, your EVM compatible smart contracts on each C chain. Then comes the chain ID. So the chain ID for this is 4311. Three, then the currency symbol is AVAX. And that's it. You save it and that's it. You are on Avalanche network. As you can see, it's driving the AVAX token from the network for this account. So I hope I was clear this time. Yep. Thank you. Um, the other question, uh, uh, understanding that you are kind of um, wanting more people to kind of use Quick Note, uh, but a question from the YouTube side, uh, they are kind of asking, uh, from your perspective, um, what are the alternatives in building a DAP um, without Quick Note? So there are a lot of other RPC providers like. Uh, um, Alchemy, Infura, Morales, and uh, Anchor. It just depends on uh, your use case that which one you want to go with. And a lot of these RPC providers support different different types of chain. So I'm not sure which ones which ones provide Avalanche, but because the, a lot of them choose which blockchain they want to support based on their business models. So you can go with any RPC provider, depends on your use case and it depends on like even speed, like latency and everything differs in from RPC provider to RPC provider. And also the thing is the aspect of security as well. So QuickNode has different um, security aspects to secure your RPC URL. We have, we support JWTs to IP, IP address, uh, restrictions to domain masking to referral whitelisting so as well as multiple auth tokens so yeah I mean it depends on what you are getting out of these RPC providers and your use cases and latency obviously it's because that's the biggest factor in choosing a RPC provider okay thanks for the, um, answering the slightly tough question um <laughs> The other question that came out is, um, can we actually create dApps using uh, Vue.js instead of React? Yes. So you can just, uh, so there's this library called ethers.js. I'll type it in the chat for everyone. So yes, you can create, it, create any app, uh, which is mentioned in the guide. You, you can create any app using view.js or any JS framework for that say, and you just have to import that ethers.js library and use its function in your view app. That's it. Mm. Okay. So let's, let's yeah. take uh, some, some opportunity to explore a little bit on the quick note bounty. They actually put it up there. Um, is there basically a specific theme that the team is actually looking at? when you put up the bounty, um, because the chance statement, statement is generally quite generic. Um, yeah. So maybe um, from the mentor's perspective or potentially the judge's perspective, what you guys are looking out for in terms of submission, they are being uh, submitted for the quick note bounty. Um, so we don't want to restrict the hackers to think in a specific direction because you know the web3 field in itself is so new and there are so many new and innovative ideas coming up so that we don't want to restrict our restrict the hackers to think in a specific direction so it's open to all ideas you just have to use the quick note url or the quick note node to like to, in your project and that's it you will be eligible for the quick note bounty and uh, you don't have to build on a specific team. Theme. It can be anything. It can be DeFi to NFT to like uh, community goods to any like anything, social goods or social network or anything. Like we don't want to restrict anyone. And uh, I can see that there's another question that which says, "Is there uh, is the free plan good enough for this hackathon?" So I would say that yes, it should be good enough because uh, it has 
it it uh, it has significant amount of requests which gives like RPC requests it gives you, but uh, if you reach the limit on free plan, you can just drop a text in the quick note channel on the hackathon discord and uh, I can help you out with some free credits for higher plan as well. Okay, uh, cool. So I, uh, I think let's, let's talk a little bit about the hackathon in itself. Um, understand if you are part of the mentoring uh, panel that's going to guide the, the participants along as well. Um, so maybe just kind of quickly use the opportunity to just kind of um, share a little bit with the audience uh, apart from the mental office hours that the teams can actually secure time with you um how else would be uh, you know a best way for for the participant to kind of get hold of you should they have any question about the you know about things that they're kind of building yeah so as you already mentioned like uh, we have the discord channel like dedicated discord channel they can reach out to me on that discord channel or if they do not want to reach out to me there, since it's a public channel, a lot of people are like hesitant to drop a text in a public channel. So they can simply shoot me a DM on Twitter or uh, they can just DM me. I have already sent a text in that Discord channel. They can just DM me and I'll be there to answer their queries, whatever it is. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much, uh, Sahil, for taking the time to run through um, the workshop uh, and essentially answering some of the questions as well. Um, thank you for taking the time and uh, we'll move on to the next segment. Um, so the next uh, next part, uh, just welcome uh, Vishwa uh, from the Graph Foundation. Essentially, we'll be bringing you through um, building decentralized uh, GraphQL API, uh, APIs uh, for blockchain data. Um, and Vishwa, the time is yours now. Thank you so much, Justin. Super happy to be here, guys. Um, I will be presenting, as Justin mentioned already, um, about building decentralized GraphQL APIs for blockchain data. Uh, let me start. This says that I cannot share the screen. Can you enable sc screen sharing for me, please? Yep, uh, you should be able to do it now. Awesome. So we will dive right into the workshop. Da -da. I hope everyone can see my slides and hear me as well. Yeah. All good. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, um, hey everyone, I am Vish and today I'm super excited to be um, presenting on building decentralized GraphQL APIs with the graph. And this is going to be a half an hour, half of, um, a bit of brief about what the graph is, um, what we're doing at the graph, what subgraphs are and how they fit into your Web3 stack and how to build subgraphs. Um, so it will be some explanation and some overview of all of the things that I mentioned. And the other half will be um, a live demo on how to build a decentralized GraphQL API, which is what we call subgraphs at the graph um, using the Zora NFT marketplace protocol um, so we will basically be building an NFT API live. And so thank you so much for tuning in. Um, let's jump right into it. I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Vish and I'm a developer relations engineer at the Graph Foundation. And my passion is building deeply engaged dev communities. Um, so, which is why I invest a lot of my time in helping developers become successful with um, any tools, any frameworks, protocols that they're using. Um, and at the graph, I focus a lot on developer education as well. So contributing to the docs, uh, working closely with the docs team, making sure that any feedback that we get from our community has um, been heard and um, would, would love to, um, you know, uh, make sure that from you, you can learn um, from this workshop. I do these kind of workshops a lot at hackathons both in-person and online as well. Uh, so let's get started. The decentralized indexing and querying protocol of Web3, that is basically the graph. Um, the graph community plays a prominent role in supporting DAP developers by making open decentralized data easily accessible using GraphQL. Um, 
So in simpler terms, as an analogy, the graph does for open data on the blockchain, what basically Google does for the web. Um, and so using GraphQL, uh, using the graph, um, anyone can build and publish open APIs known as subgraphs that make data on the blockchain accessible. So as a developer, if you have um, an idea for a DAP that you're building and you're using data from the blockchain, um, the graph ensures that uh, you can easily index and query that data from the blockchain using subgraphs, which are decentralized GraphQL APIs. Now I've been saying this a lot, subgraphs, the graphs, these terms. So let me go deeper into what each of these mean. The graph is actually a protocol and subgraphs are a Web3 standard um, of how to index and query using the graph protocol. So with subgraphs as the main API layer that sits between your UI and your data layer, your UI is the front end and then the data layer being any decentralized data from smart contracts um, and application data that you will be serving to your front end. Um, subgraphs sit in between as the main API layer. And with that, the graph is becoming a default part of the Web3 stack and subgraphs are now becoming a Web3 standard. Now, I often get this question a lot. Where does the graph come into picture? Like I've been saying um, that the graph is the easiest way to query and everything to index the blockchain data, but how and why? Let me paint a picture for you. The, in, in this data-driven world of ours, our data is stored across huge storage networks and blockchains. And the blockchain gets huge, huge, huge amount of transactions per day. Um, think of the biggest number and it could be bigger than that. So applications that we build um, on top of this data, like using this blockchain data, need to be um, served with properly organized and indexed data for high performance and great UI UX. Um, and this has been becoming increasingly difficult with the amount of data that is being stored on the blockchain. Not just that, Developers have been trying to build their own indexing servers and indexing solutions um, for this, but writing these proprietary, proprietary servers is expensive and it is error prone. So not just that, it like building these proprietary servers also means that there is going to be a single point of failure. It's, um, it, it requires engineering and hardware resources that come with a cost in itself. And last but the most important part is that it disrupts the core idea of decentralization. And at the graph, we take decentralization um, very seriously. So enter the graph in this scenario. It provides a globally open API. It's the easiest way to index and query blockchain data efficiently because it has a transparent, open, and a robust network it is decentralized in, the, in a way that there are there is no single point of failure and there are various roles or network participants that contribute to different tasks. There are developers who build subgraph, um, who build subgraphs, which are these decentralized APIs that other consumers can then use for their tasks. There are indexers that index the subgraphs. Um, uh, so they basically um, index any of the subgraphs that are being built by the subgraph developers and there are curators. Now, how do you know that a particular subgraph is of high quality and that you can be, that it is trustworthy, that the data is reliable, it is accurate, it is well indexed? How do indexers know that this is a good subgraph that they should be indexing? There are so many subgraphs out there on the decentralized network. This is where the curators as a role come in. Um, curators are the network participants uh, in the graph decentralized network who tell the community, the indexes, which subgraphs to curate on by signaling on them. And then there are the delegators who delegate their resources, their tokens um, to the network, uh, to, to the curators. So this is how the decentralized network on the graph has been built. And it is an open uh, and transparent model. Um, 
But talking about more tactical things, more technical things uh, on the engineering side, the graph is built on top of GraphQL, which comes with its own benefits um, and developer experience. So the conclusion is that the graph is, it provides you a global API for use cases that include things like NFT marketplaces, galleries and metaverses, music and video, social and communication platforms, um, gaming and DeFi, which is also the theme of this hackathon. Um, and talking about DeFi, the graph has been powering so many DeFi um, projects um, and DeFi dApps that have been querying on-chain data, like trade and exchange volumes, total borrowed supplied state, asset prices, wallet balances, yield farming, total value locked, and so much more. So all of these cute little icons that you see um, are DeFi projects that have been using the graph data, uh, data on the blockchain that is being indexed by subgraphs. The graph has also been powering quite a lot of complex use cases and applications for um, allowing for richer data on dApps. So websites like CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap use uh, the graph um, NFT and DAO use cases like the foundation and juice box DAO you may have heard about is um, are, are again powered by the graph. The graph has also powered DeFi, um, big, big names in the DeFi space like Uniswap and Synthetix. And that is just to name a few. 350 plus dApps have been migrated to the decentralized network. So um, a little bit insight into the hosted service and the decentralized network. There are two services that are run by the graph currently, which the first one is the hosted service, which was launched a few years ago. And it has been supporting um, subgraphs and subgraph developers um, to uh, for their dApps for nearly four years now. And the other one is the decentralized network that I mentioned earlier with the four network participants. Um, which was launched last year. Um, just a quick overview of um, the hosted service versus the decentralized network is that the hosted service um, served as an MVP, um, kind of like a um, first uh, version of uh, what we uh, envisioned as um, you know the graph network, but it was a hosted service which had uh, which was maintained by one of our core developer teams, Ejen Noen. Um, it is not decentralized. It was a centralized service, um, which was launched uh, initially to um, gain product market fit um, and to make sure that some of the subgraph features are being tested um, by the developers and by um, some of our core devs while they keep working towards a more decentralized future. And only last year, we launched a decentralized network, um, fully decentralized. Uh, so it basically does what the hosted service um, did, but it has no single point of failure. There are various network participants, um, which just means that um, all of the indexers index the, the subgraphs, subgraph developers build the subgraphs, curators signal on good quality subgraphs. Um, and so 350 plus dApps have been migrated to the decentralization, uh, uh, the decentralized network. And these are the ones that um, have been migrated. You can see some, uh, some familiar ones there, Radical, there is Sushi, um, Poa, um, there is Pool Together, Dodo, Artblocks, and so many more. The hosted service so far has been supporting 39 chains um, like Near, Polygon, Avalanche, Celo, Arbitrum, Phantom, Fuse, Optimism, and so many more. So that is about the graph and subgraphs and how basically the whole idea fits into your Web3 stack. Um, but I think it will start making more sense uh, once we've tested out um, tested it out for ourselves. Um, so we will be diving into some code, doing a live demo of how to build um, a subgraph using the subgraph studio. Now, I just want to, um, let me stop sharing and make sure that I'm sharing the whole desktop.
Um, just give me a minute. That's all. That's right. So um, I just want to make sure we know some um, prerequisites and some, um, you know, um, workshop notes before we get started with building our first subgraph. The dashboard that you see on the screen right now is the subgraph studio. And if you go to the graph.com slash studio, um, this is kind of like the um, developer environment that you can use to build a subgraph on and deploy it on the decentralized network. However, if you wanted to host your subgraph on the hosted service and not the decentralized network, then it would be a slightly different process. Um, Avalanche, uh, the graph is live on Ethereum mainnet currently on the decentralized network. And we have other chains like Avalanche, um, Polygon, Neosis, and so many more um, uh, planned out in the future. So they will be supported on the decentralized network. For now, for the time being, uh, chains like Avalanche are not supported on the decentralized network. But if you want to build on it currently, build a subgraph um, and deploy it, um, then uh, and use the uh, use Avalanche as your chain. Um, then make sure that you use the hosted service. Um, otherwise, if you want to deploy it to Ethereum mainnet, then you can use the same route as I'm explaining right now. I am the reason that I'm showcasing the decentralized uh, network, like de deploying to the decentralized network using the Subgraph Studio, is because um, the there are plans to sunset the hosted service um, in the first quarter of 2023, and this has been officially announced by um, the Graph team at Graph Day. Uh, so if you want to read more about, uh, let me share the blog post with you. If you want to read more about um, the announcement and the plan, the roadmap, um, make sure that you read, uh, you check out this uh, blog post, uh, which is, um, sorry, I think this is the Subgraph Studio, uh, some setting. Here it is, go to some setting the hosted service and I will drop it in the chat for you guys. Um, Da, da, da. Yeah, so the first link is going to link you to the guide that is building with Subgraph Studio. So you can use that guide to follow along with this workshop and make sure that um, once the workshop has ended, you can try it out for yourself and ask me any questions that you have. And the second link um, is the sunsetting of the hosted service. So this is the road to the sunsetting, and I will talk more about it um, towards the end of the workshop once we're done with the live demo. Now let's get started with uh, subgraphs. So the guide that I mentioned earlier is this one, um, and I've linked it in the chat so that you can follow along. Some prerequisites to get started with building your first subgraphs is uh, make sure that you have Node.js installed on, on your machine and make sure that you have a MetaMask wallet that you can then connect to the subgraph studio. I already have mine connected here, which is why you can see wishmeta.eth connected here. And um, this is basically your identity that you can use to, just like your Gmail, um, anyone in the crypto space or the Web3 space can um, uh, would know about this already. But if you don't know, this is basically how you sign in to any of the platforms. Um, and similarly, on Subgraph Studio, you can connect your um, wallet uh, the best way is the MetaMask um, Chrome extension so that you can make sure that you can sign in easily, quickly from your browser every time. Um, the first step that we're going to do here is creating your first subgraph. So this is the subgraph studio. I'm going to click on create. And for the time being, since this is um, a demo on the decentralized network, I will select mainnet and name this AV hacks or avalanche hacks. Um, that is the name of my subgraph or the subgraph slug and it is available to me. Click on continue. This is going to create a subgraph on the subgraph studio. So you have already created 
um, an image of the GraphQL API, the decentral, uh, decentralized GraphQL API that you want to build. Now, what we want to do is start defining our subgraph. And so that is something that we will do using the graph CLI um, in our uh, local environment. I already have the graph CLI um, installed on my machine. So make sure that you have uh, installed uh, the graph CLI on your machine. And here are a few quick steps to do that using both NPM and Yarn. You can use either. Uh, should just take um, a couple minutes um, max. So once you've installed the graph CLI, um, this is something that will help you use some utility commands um, and help you define your subgraph using the subgraph studio. Once you've installed the graph CLI, um, you can see some more documentation here. So th there are basically a few different steps in the process of defining and deploying a subgraph. The first one is that you initialize your subgraph. And what that means is that you will be initializing, you will, um, the, the graph init command will help you initialize the bare bones, uh, the bare bones structure, the boilerplate code for your subgraph that you will then go on and edit depending on your requirements. And then you authenticate your subgraph once you're done doing that. Uh, after the definition part of it, to make sure that your subgraph in the local environment, all of your code has been connected to this subgraph on the subgraph studio. Um, and the authentication will then be done using the deploy key here. Please do not share your deploy keys with anyone. <laughs> and the last step is going to be um, the graph deploy. And what this does is that it will, using the subgraph studio, it will deploy. Um, your subgraph on the graph decentralized network. So let's get started. The initialized command is graph init studio av hacks. Studio flag just means that um, it is just letting um, the graph CLI know that we are using the studio, subgraph studio as the product and not the hosted service, which is why we mentioned this flag. There are a couple more flags um, that help you kickstart some code that you then don't have to worry about once you've um, gotten your boilerplate code, and which is why there is this um, longer graph init command. And maybe I can um, start explaining that once I run that command. So I'm going to paste this command, and while it runs, I can explain what, what it does. Um, once you run this command, it says Ethereum. So as a protocol to select Ethereum, subgraph slug was AV hats, if you remember it. Go ahead and direct you to create the subgraph in. Yes. Um, make sure that you just accept the defaults. We will be using mainnet. The contract address is something that we already um, mentioned. Contract name is token. And it is, as you see, it says scaffolding. Uh, and generating a subgraph. So while it does that, let me explain what the graph init command does. Now this graph init command has a few flags like contract name, index events, studio, from contract, etc. So the from contract address, uh, uh, sorry, flag, lets you mention the smart contract address. Um, we are using the Sora NFT smart contract. Um, which is an ERC20 address for um, tokens, um, NFTs. Um, and it is publicly um, usable. So make sure if you want to use it, check it out. Um, you go through the, their developer docs. <clears throat> the studio flag here is, um, it mentions, it lets the, <coughs> sorry, the environment know that we will be using the subgraph studio and not the hosted service. <clears throat> now, the index event flag here uh, gives you some code that lets you interact with some of the events that are emitted by the smart contract. <coughs> now, the smart contract that we're using here has um, some other contracts. And so the contract that we will be using is token. And thus we use the token name 
flag to describe which uh, contract we'll be using, which is the token contract. <clears throat> and as you can see, we have successfully run the command, <coughs> sorry, the graph init command, and we are now ready to dive uh, right into it. Here is our workspace. And we can start exploring the workspace here. There are three main files that we will be, we will be editing and looking at um, for the purpose of defining our subgraph. Now, these three files are subgraph.yaml, schema.graphql, and in the source, you will see mapping.ts for TypeScript. Now, if you go to the subgraph.yaml file, um, you will see a bunch of things here, even in the schema.graphql file, a bunch of things here. Um, you see mappings, there is so much code already written, and that is the beauty of the graph init command. What it does is it scaffolds the subgraph boilerplate code for you so that it is easier for you to get started um, if this is your first subgraph. Now, your subgraph.yaml file is basically your generic um, YAML file, which describes the configuration of your subgraph. And we have already, if you remember the graph init command, the longer version, um, we had already mentioned a few things like Ethereum token, the network is mainnet, um, the address is this, um, and you know the ABI is token again. There are some entities that have already been mentioned here, um, some event handlers that come from the um, event um, flag, the from events flag, and which is why we use that flag so that we can start interacting with the events that are emitted by the smart contract. We will be making some edits in here. For example, um, let's make sure that we have a start block mentioned and we will get the start block from the guide. And basically what this does is that, here it is, for the smart contract, we already know which block we want um, our subgraph to start indexing from so that it doesn't start from the genesis block. And this is optional, but I would always recommend, um, you know, mentioning, describing the start block so that um, your subgraph knows where to start indexing from instead of, from the, instead of the genesis block. Now let's get rid of these entities because we want to define entities of our own. That would be token and user. And you'll get to know what these are um, in a bit. Event handlers, maybe we can just keep token URI updated and transfer and get rid of all of these for the sake of this um, demo. So entities basically um, let you define the data that you want your subgraph to index from the blockchain and that you want your subgraph to query. Um, and so that is token and user. Token gives the data of all of the tokens, um, all of the NFTs that are owned by users. And then the user entity will describe all of the fields that you want your subgraph to query um, that are related to the user metadata. And we will describe these entities here in schema.graphql. Event handlers are basically functions that you will write later on in the mapping file um, so that you can handle the events that are then emitted from the smart contract. There is a token URI updated event and a transfer event. And token URI updated event is emitted basically whenever a URI of a token is being updated, the URI of the NFT is being updated. And the transfer event happens whenever the transfer um, takes place, whenever either a new token is being minted or an existing token's um, ownership is being transferred from one user to another. And so these are the, uh, you know, the events that we will be writing um, functions for in our mapping file. And that is basically some business logic that will be executed whenever the events are being emitted from the smart contract. And so we will be writing some 
some of that business logic to map the events to the entities here that we are describing the schema.graphql file. And so let's go ahead and get rid of this as well. Let's make sure that we click save because we made a bunch of changes here and we are going to get rid of that. Um, there are a couple of edits that we're going to make in the schema.graphql file. For the sake of this workshop, I am going to paste the entities <clears throat> token and user from this guide so that you can follow along later on. Um, a quick run through of what this does is that we're defining two entities, token and user, using the at entity directive, which is something that if you've used GraphQL before, you would know that this directive lets you um, define, uh, um, you know, uh, types that have top level fields that we want our subgraph, um, your, our GraphQL API to query, like ID, token ID, content URI, metadata URI. If there's a timestamp for the NFT, then create that timestamp. Um, the creator of the NFT, so that is the user, or uh, the object user. There's another object user for the owner um, field. Um, and this basically is the person who owns the NFT currently. We're also querying for, we also want to query the user metadata. And so we're defining that using the at entity directive again. And here you will see something different, which is the at derived from directive. And what this basically does is um, create a one to many relationship from tokens to owner and created to creator. So, um, NFTs are being created by creators and a particular token, um, a particular NFT is being owned by various owners um, at different points in time, which is why we want to um, create one-to-many relationships. So a creator can have, can create many tokens, a owner can, an owner can um, own many tokens as well. And the reason why we don't define an array um, and we use the at derived from directive to um, create this one to many relationship is that it dramatically improves the performance while indexing um, the data because um, the one side of the relationship is stored on the graph node and the many side is derived from the data that we already have stored. So that is a quick overview of the schema.graphql file. That's all the edits that we want to make. Now, before moving on to mapping, um, we will be making some changes here in this logic as well. We want to run a very important command called the graph cogen command. Actually, um, let's make sure that we've saved all of the changes here. And yes, the graph cogen command. And, the, and this says that the types have been generated successfully. Um, what basically the graph code gen command does is that it gives us a couple of, um, it gives us a couple of, um, uh, it, it gives us a TypeScript library um, out of the box so that we can use some um, functions, we can import them um, and make use of them in the mapping file. Um, so you will see a bunch of generated files in the token, uh, in, sorry, in the generated folder. And what these functions um, are is that um, th these are basically um, things that let us, uh, code that lets us interact with the graph node. Um, so we can either read from the graph node or save new data from the smart contract to the graph node. So there's a read and write function happening on the graph node. Um, but when it comes to um, the smart contract, we are unable to write data on it, but we will be reading a lot of data from it and making sure that we store it to the graph node to be able to index it later on. And this is what um, the generated code helps us do. And we get that generated code using the graph code gen command. Now that this has been, um, uh, run successfully. What we are going to do is again, get rid of all of this because we have defined new entities. 
and we are going to be pasting some logic from our guide here. And that is basically the handle transfer event handler that we defined in our subgraph.yaml file here. And the next one is the, actually, we're not going to use this one. Um, and the next one is the handle token URI data that we have here. What these uh, functions basically do is that we're, as you can see, we've imported some code from the generated token folder and the generated schema file that is, and that has been generated here by the graph code gen command. And we're using that code to define functions and handle transfer and handle token URI updated. Um, what this does is whenever the particular event transfer is being emitted from the um, smart contract, we want our um, business logic that we've defined here to be executed. And what that does is whenever the NFT is being, the ownership of an NFT is being transferred or a new NFT is being, being minted, it is going to check. So, which is why there is an if loop here. If the token already exists, that's then it's going to change the ownership and save it, save the new owner details to the graph node. And if the NFT does not exist, it just means there is a new NFT being minted, which is why it executes this part of the function, which says that in case of a new NFT, um, just retrieve the user and save it to the graph node. That is just a quick explanation of what kind of logic we have written here. And for the handle token, uh, token URI function, it basically handles the token URI updated event happening. And this is pretty simple, just because uh, we already know that the token, uh, the URI of the token has been updated and we don't really care about the previous token URI. We only want the newest, the latest one um, on our graph node so that we can query that information later. Uh, so we retrieve the token and the new, the current content URI of the token and then save it to the graph node. This is what basically this logic here is implementing. Now, once we've done that, let's make sure that we have saved all of the changes and that's it. That is how we define our subgraph and we're ready to authenticate our subgraph. So just a quick review. Um, we created a subgraph on our subgraph studio called AV Hacks. We um, installed a graph CLI. So in case you did not have it installed, you can install it. I already had it installed. Um, and then using the graph CLI commands, we use the graph init command to scaffold a new subgraph, which is boilerplate code for you to get started. And it gives you this folder structure. We went in, into the graph uh, subgraph YAML file and defined the configuration of our subgraph. Like the smart contract address, we want to be using the start block of that smart contract, what kind of entities we want to define and the kind of event handlers that we will be defining later on uh, for us to interact with the smart contract events. And in the schema.graphql file, we define all of the data that we want our GraphQL API to index. And then lastly, we ran the graph code gen command to generate some code for us um, to write assembly script mappings. Assembly script, if you've used TypeScript or JavaScript, assembly script is very similar. Um, and it lets you write mappings that can then map the event uh, data the event from the smart contract to your entity um, or your entities defined as part of your schema.graphql file. And so we have done, some, uh, this is what we've done here. We've written these mappings that we want uh, to be implemented, to be executed whenever these events happen. Um, and yeah, we are ready to um, carry out this part of the, um, subgraph journey, which is the graph authentication command 
uh, the graph CLI command that lets you authenticate your subgraph using your um, deploy key, which is here. Um, so I'll just copy this because it is specific to my subgraph. Paste it here. And this has been, my deploy key has been set um, on my uh, subgraph studio. The last thing that I want to be doing is the graph deploy command, which is graph deploy studio AV hacks. And this is going to deploy my subgraph AV hacks to the decentralized network. So before deploying, I want to show that it says undeployed, the status here on the subgraph studio. And after deploying, it should turn to deployed. It's doing a bunch of things. The deploy is in place. And yes, it has been deployed to the graph.com slash studio slash subgraph slash AV hacks, which is basically this um, right here. And now if you can see, it says deployed and the data has been synced 100%. Um, a very fun part of once you've deployed the graph uh, subgraph is that you can go to the playground on your subgraph dashboard and make sure that you can test out your subgraph um, to then use it to query, start querying data to your front end and um, implement it in your DAP. And here we already have an example query which queries, uh, it requests, uh, requests the first five tokens, the first five NFTs with their IDs, token IDs, content URIs, and metadata URIs. And from the user's entity, um, it is requesting the first five users with their IDs, tokens, and token IDs, and created at IDs. And so we will quickly hit the play button to make sure that we get a response. And here it is. So um, here is the content URI of the token. I'm not sure what this content is going to be. So just to be safe, I won't be opening this link, but um, you can always test out um, if you wanna try um, which NFT this is um, querying from the Zora NFT smart contract, the NFT marketplace you can always go to this link and it will take you to the NFT that is on the blockchain. And that is pretty cool. This is the data that we get directly from the blockchain, from the smart contract. And if you see the schema right here, it has, this is the GraphQL schema that we defined. So you will see token and user. So if you go to token, all of the data that our decentralized GraphQL is um, indexing and querying has been described here which is something that I love about GraphQL, that how the documentation is um, super readable by the user and it is right here in some of our um, development environments. And here is the user entity with the ID tokens and created. And that is how we um, build a subgraph. I just want to quickly share some ending notes as I promised earlier. Um, we learned how to build a subgraph, which is a decentralized uh, GraphQL API. We learned how to do that and deploy it on the decentralized network. Um, but if you want to use Avalanche, you can use the hosted service. The reason why I did not use the hosted service is that um, we have decided on a timeline to deprecate the hosted service that has been paving the path to full, um, a fully decentralized network on the graph. Right, and um, nearly for four years, uh, the hosted service has been serving subgraphs, um, supporting subgraph developers to build on it. Um, but it served as um, um, it's uh, it served as an initial version of what we were envisioning, so that we can get product market fit and we can make sure that it is being tested out, and then we can progressively move towards um, a fully decentralized network. We launched the decentralized network last year, and we have been slowly migrating dApps. We've been slowly migrating subgraphs um, on the chains, the networks that are live on the decentralized network currently. And we have more um, network, more chains to be added um, in the future as well. So I'm super excited about that. Um, the foundation has been laying out um, a three-phase plan 
for sunsetting of the whole sleep service. And this is uh, on the screen, you can see the plan described as by the end of uh, third quarter of 2022, uh, no new subgraph deployments on the hosted service by quarter four, no new upgrades for the subgraphs on the hosted service. And by the end of Q1 on, in 2023, our goal is to fully phase out the hosted service for all network enabled chains so that we can work towards a fully decentralized future on the graph. This is the overview of the graph roadmap uh, some of uh, some exciting problems that we're working to solve for the developers is, um, you know, performance, speed, and developer experience, index of experience. So we are working on subgraph migration to the decentralized network, multi-chain on the network. So not just Ethereum, um, but we also announced uh, Cosmos support recently. So not just Ethereum, Cosmos, or some of the other chains, but um, some uh, popular ones like Avalanche as well. Uh, indexing performance, substreams and firehose that we spoke about at graph day, um, and so much more. So um, if you want to learn more about it, make sure that you go check out the graph uh, blog, which is thegraph.com slash blog. To get involved and join the Web3 movement, um, please check out the graph.com website. And if you want to learn more about uh, building subgraphs or, or the hosted service, the decentralized network, um, the product in general, or which kinds of networks and chains we are supporting, um, go check out the official docs at the graph.com slash docs. Our Twitter is graph protocol and um, Discord is the graph.com slash Discord. So if you have any questions, we will be hanging out in the, uh, in the Avalanche Hacks uh, Discord server. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, my name is Vish, and I am Vishwa Mehta Suri on Twitter. So if you want a more personal um, uh, conversation, then we can uh, chat over Twitter DMs. But feel free to reach out in uh, the public channels on Avalanche Hacks Discord as well. And I, me and my team will see you uh, online. <laughs> Thank you so much. Happy hacking. Thank you so much, Vishba, for um, going through, um, basically bringing everyone quickly up to speed what um, the graph does uh, and also doing a quick demo. Um, probably before we kind of wrap up um, today's session, uh, just to help set context for the participants at the hackathon, essentially, um, basically the graph had actually put up uh, two bounties, um, one of which, which is best new graph bounty and the other one will be best use of existing subgraphs. Maybe you could just like to help everyone to understand a little bit further um, what essentially are you kind of looking at for both of these bounties? Absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, we basically have two categories of bounties uh, for this hackathon, which is um, the first one is best new subgraph uh, on the graph explorer or on the decentralized network. So um, if you're building a custom subgraph for your DAP or your project, um, then we'd love to check out your submission. What, um, what, you, what this looks like is whatever I just explained. It doesn't have to be the same example or the same smart contract. It could be um, that subgraph could be querying any public data on the blockchain. Um, and if it is a new subgraph that you build for uh, avalanche hacks, then it is um, a qualified uh, subgraph for the first category of the bounty. Similarly, the second category is um, best usage of an existing subgraph. So I can see there is a question in the chat um, from YouTube. Um, and the answer is that um, you can use an existing uh, subgraph. You can query using an existing subgraph. You don't have to build it out. If it's already there and you like the quality of the subgraph, you can go to the subgraph studio, um, sorry, the decentralized network, uh, which is the graph explorer uh, on the graph website um, and search for that subgraph and then start querying from the subgraph dashboard. Um, it is pretty simple and I am happy to show you um, or, or link you to a demo of that uh, in Discord as well later on. Um, another question, so that's an, the second category 
of the bounty, which is usage of best usage of an existing subgraph. So you either build a new subgraph, a custom subgraph for your um, project or your DAP, or you can use an existing one that is already on the Graph Explorer, and that's how you qualify for the graph bounty. Um, yes, someone linked in the chat, which is the Subgraph Ex Explorer, thank you. Um, the second question is, can you talk a little more with examples of what events are emitted? Um, it kind of depends on what kind of uh, smart contracts or what kind of data you are working with. Um, uh, so, for example, if it's an NFT smart contract, then these events uh, can be metadata URI updated or transfer event, which is the transfer of the ownership um, of a token, or it is the content URI updated event, as you saw that I mentioned in my workshop. Um, and there are so many other examples like this. So it basically depends. Um, the kinds of events that are emitted basically depends on the smart contract. Um, but if you want to learn more about what kind of ev uh, events are emitted from the smart contract and how to handle them, this is something that will um, be described well um, in the smart contract documentation. So the smart contract that you're using, if there's a DeFi, DeFi smart contract, um, then they should have some documentation that describes the kind of events that are being emitted. And similarly, for any other gaming um, related data out there. All right, uh, thanks Vishra. Um, one last question um, before we end off today's session. Um, one question from you two is also to just kind of ask, so is Subgraph just an API? Yes, Subgraph is just an API but it is a decentralized API, meaning that there is so much happening in the background. Um, so instead of it being um, hosted or deployed on um, a centralized server, um, it is being deployed on the decentralized network. Um, so it is like your typical GraphQL API, but it it is decentralized in the sense that it indexes blockchain data um, and it cannot, uh, index off-chain data. So the limitation with subgraph, and I wouldn't really call it limitation, but the beauty of the subgraphs is that it works fully with on-chain data. So any data that you see on the blockchain, um, and if it's uh, if it has a smart contract or if you are building a smart contract, then you should be able to use subgraphs to start uh, querying that data over to your front end. Okay. So in that case, um, can someone actually transfer um, their own subgraph in the future to someone else? Uh, yes, now it is possible because we recently um, uh, announced a feature uh, which create, uh, which is basically the idea of subgraphs as NFTs. So you can um, share the ownership with your team or you can transfer the ownership of a particular subgraph to another user or another team member. All right, thank you so much. So, thank um, you so much. Yep, uh, thanks Vishwa for going through the content and today, um, basically just kind of wrap up today's session. Um, essentially tomorrow we are also running two more sessions that's going to be led by uh, Everlabs uh, folks uh, to run you through a couple more uh, sessions to help you get more acquainted on building Everlaunch itself. Uh, it's going to take place same time uh, as today's session, essentially. So you have not already done so. Um, the registration link to the session can actually be found on Discord. Uh, and if you have any question for uh, Sahil from QuickNote or uh, Vishwa from The Graph, um, they are available on the Avalanche Hackathon channel. Um, and you know you can just kind of ask them any of the questions that you would have uh, moving off today's session as well. So thank you everyone for taking time to join us uh, in today's session. Um, hope to see you tomorrow and all the best for the hackathon as well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.